This is the first of two lectures that are intended to introduce you to the phenomena of religion and spirituality. This lecture, along with the second lecture, will be the basis for your introductory exam. Okay, let's just begin with the word religion. Uh, religion is a compound word uh, coming from two Latin terms. The first one I think all of you already know, and that is the term re, which means to do something again. And then if you can hear in the second part of the word, uh, the Latin term ligare, in which we get our English term for ligament, of uh, binding or attaching uh, two bones together. And so what we have here with re ligare or religion is it is a way for a person to bind or attach themselves uh, to an ultimate spiritual reality or perhaps a personal being that one might call a, a god. And so um, the reason that this needs to be done again is for some reason there has been a, a brokenness that's taken place in that original attachment to ultimate reality or to a being, again, that one might call God, or a collection of beings that could be called gods. Uh, you see here on the picture that we have symbols for several different of the world religions, and you'll be seeing these throughout the semester. I think you probably recognize at least a few of them. What religion attempts to do for its adherents is to try to make some sense of the human experience. Um, questions such as, uh, why is there suffering? Um, is there any sort of ultimate purpose or meaning to life? Uh, what is the way that we should act toward one another in community? And even how do we decide who is a part of the community and who is not a part of the community if that's the case? So uh, really um, religion is seeking some sort of transcendent source for uh, the meaning and purpose of life. Now, we also have to realize with religion, and this is why we have, uh, of course, many people are cynical about religion, is the uh, predicament of human finitude. Uh, if that's a new term for you, it is the recognition that we as humans are finite, that there is no sort of empirical or rational argument we can make that would prove a religion as in an experiment. There is a certain uh, element of what we would call an existentialist uh, trust. Uh, some people would use the word faith, and we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, but, of course, in the midst of human finitude, of realizing our lack of control and our lack of knowledge, uh, religion still dwells within the scope of having some sort of hope that there is uh, a reality beyond this life, something that is not finite, but that is, in fact, infinite and will last forever, something that is eternal. All right, let's ask the question, why are humans uh, religious? Uh, some will actually point to an, a negative uh, reason for there being the existence of religion. A fine example of that is the fellow pictured here in the top right. Uh, this is the German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, he proposes that religion is a harmful human invention and that it is used by those who already have power to perpetuate or continue uh, the system of power or control that they have over others. Uh, Nietzsche argued uh, for the need of humanity to discover what he called the ubermensch, which we could translate as, uh, in English we translate that as the overman. And this is the person who can come to terms with human finitude and uh, realize that uh, we have just this one life of having these material bodies and to dwell on anything that would come after that is uh, foolish, really a sort of a, a pipe dream. Uh, that humanity should overcome instead of using religion as some sort of a sentimental crutch or even worse as a way to try to control others. Uh, similar to Nietzsche is the political philosopher uh, Karl Marx and uh, the sci uh, psychiatrist Sigmund Freud and the great philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, I'll say just a bit more here. Uh, Marx uh, used a phrase that many of you may be familiar with. He called religion the opiate of the masses. You know, an opiate is a, is a drug, and so religion is a drug of a way of dumbing people down so that you continue to have control uh, over them. And, of course, someone like Freud uh, went into uh, human psychology, especially in, in many cases the psychology of sexuality, to talk about how God images are used to make people feel ashamed uh, and guilty and as another means of controlling them. 
Uh, let's move down here to Immanuel Kant, who's pictured on the bottom right. Uh, he also believed that religion was a human invention, but uh, different from Nietzsche, uh, Kant, uh, and Kant, by the way, comes well before Nietzsche chronologically, uh, but Kant believed that religion was something invented by humanity, but instead of being harmful, it's actually helpful to society that religion is something that establishes ethical behavior and uh, moral um, obligations that we have toward one another. And his most well-known teaching uh, in this field is the philosophical uh, term, the categorical imperative. And you need to have a decent understanding of this in your notes. The categorical imperative is very similar to uh, what some religions call the golden rule. And it is the idea that your behavior uh, toward others should be so uniform in the way that you act toward them that that is the very same way you would act toward them regardless of what the circumstances were. So the categorical imperative is insisting that you don't allow circumstances to determine the way you treat others, but that you have a sort of moral coding within you of knowing how to treat others, and not just knowing how, but being disciplined enough to treat others in the right way, uh, again, regardless of circumstances. Uh, one other fellow to mention here is Ludwig Feuerbach. You see his name is the last one on the slide. Feuerbach was a uh, German theologian, philosopher of religion, who argued that God was a projection that humanity made up. In other words, there's no real God out there in the heavens or in space or however you want to think of that, but that uh, almost like humanity is a film projector a camera, and we are projecting that image of God out there. And Feuerbach would say, even though that projection is not real, it's something we created, the projection still works in such a way to keep society uh, ordered. Okay, and now we take a brief look at the relationship between uh, the terms religion and faith. Um, the vast majority of the global population is re uh, religious, although this is decreasing. Uh, significantly over the past 50 years as there becomes uh, more and more of a secular humanist, uh, atheist, or agnostic uh, worldview. And by the way, atheist and agnostic do not mean the same thing. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Um, most people who are religious will certainly admit that there are aspects of the religion that are the invention of humankind. But religious people will also argue that there is some sort of core or basis, and maybe a keyword here is revelation, uh, that is given from a divine being or an ultimate reality that is the actual base of the religion. And this is where the term faith comes into religious studies. Faith is the trust that is assuming that there is some being or some ultimate reality that has provided the basis for the practices of the religion. Um, and so if you want a good working definition for faith, it is oftentimes defined as the trust in or belief in a reality beyond the self or one that is perhaps hidden deep within the self. And as we're going to see with some different religions in just a moment, this ultimate reality could be personal, but it need not be personal. Okay, there's some really important terms that you will need to be able to define that come from this slide here. Um, first off, let's talk about the term theistic. Uh, within the term theistic, you can hear or perhaps see the Greek word theos, and theos is the term that is used for a god. And um, a theistic religion believes or teaches that there is a personal being or a collection of personal beings that are part of the uh, heavens or part of even a creative force. Uh, but again, the primary concept within a theistic religion is that the ultimate reality is a personal one, either an individual uh, god like we have within uh, Judaism or a collection of gods like we have within Sanatana Dharma, which is better known as Hinduism. Now, a monotheistic religion, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam are your examples, believe that there is only one God, and then polytheism, like a Hindu belief, is the belief in many gods. Now, one thing uh, to complicate this even a bit more um, is to see within Hindu practice, it's a particular kind of polytheism, because yes, there are thousands of gods within Sanatana Dharma, 
uh, but the Hindu teachings about these gods are that they all really belong to one divine personality called Brahma. So this is the idea that a Brahma is sort of this umbrella personal being that includes all of the other personal deities. And uh, Sanatana Dharma or, or Hinduism will be the very first of the world religions that we study this semester. So you'll see more about that in a, in a week and a half, couple of weeks. All right, now the majority of Buddhists, not all of them, but the vast majority of Buddhists are non-theistic, which means that uh, they do believe that there is an ultimate reality, uh, but this ultimate reality is not uh, personal. And so that would be the distinction that we make between a, a theistic and a non-theistic religion. A theism, personal God or gods, non-theistic is a non-personal ultimate reality. Now, atheism, uh, A is the uh, Greek prefix for no or not. So atheism is saying no God. And this is the denial of any reality beyond or hidden in the material world, whether personal or not. So atheism is the conviction that there is no God, uh, really no spiritual, personal, uh, uh, or uh, even non-personal reality besides this one uh, material existence. Now, agnosticism, let's break down this word. The A, again, means no or not, and gnosis means knowledge. So this term, if we want to define it literally, means we cannot have knowledge. And so agnosticism says that we just have to say it's completely unknowable about whether there is a god or gods or ultimate reality that exists. So uh, atheism asserts there is no god, agnosticism gives us the questioning shrug to say that we simply cannot know. And now as we look at the content of religions, we see that there are many components. Uh, worship is a key component of most religious traditions. This consists uh, either of an individual, but more often a community of people coming together and practicing particular rituals that are intended to bring one closer to God or give one a greater understanding of ultimate reality. Uh, worship will consist not only of particular rituals or practices, but will almost always involve uh, myths and symbols. And we need to be very careful in defining the word myth, um, especially I find that uh, students who are particularly religious will oftentimes find it offensive to hear the stories of their particular faith called myths. And when we're in religious scholarship, as we are for this class, we're not using the term myth in its popular usage. As many will say, if something is a myth and it's not true, it's a story that is a, a lie, a falsehood. That's not the way the term myth is used in religious scholarship. Uh, the term myth in religious scholarship is not even concerned with answering the question, did this story historically happen just the way it says in the Quran or just the way it says in the Hebrew Bible or the Christian New Testament? Uh, within religious scholarship, not even trying to answer the question of the historicity of whether the story happened, we call all stories myths, and we look for the way that the myth, the story, is definitive for that religious tradition. So if we look at a story within Islamic culture about Muhammad making um, sort of a visionary uh, pilgrimage into the city of Jerusalem and then going through levels of heaven, uh, seeing Abraham and Moses and eventually coming to God and having a conversation with God about how many times one should pray a day. And then we see uh, Muhammad descending back down from the heavens and then uh, headed back to the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we wouldn't be concerned in religious scholarship of trying to prove that historically it happened just that way. Instead, we would be asking, how does that myth, well, again, not concerned with how historical it is, but how does that story or myth become definitive for that particular religious tradition? And then symbols are extremely important to uh, religious traditions. Uh, we will uh, later in the semester look at the largest world religion, which is Christianity, and we will see how both the symbol of the cross and the symbol of the fish were very uh, definitive uh, pictures to help these people identify with one another as followers of uh, Yeshua of Nazareth or Jesus of Nazareth. 
Okay, another key content of uh, religions is ethical living. Um, it's not just the idea that you should gather together for a worship service to go through rituals, but that these rituals and these worship services and these stories and these symbols are helping to form the worshiper into a more ethical person. And so that means that you are relating more correctly with the divine being or ultimate reality, but you're also uh, relating more uh, righteously or morally or correctly with other members of your community. Um, a fine example of this within uh, Judaism, uh, really ancient Hebraism, is the example of what's called the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, where you have four rules or commandments about a right relationship with Yahweh or God, and then six commandments about a right relationship within community with one another. And then also within the study of religions, we'll see that there are dogmatic teachings that are a part of many uh, religious traditions. These are putting forth what the convictions are of a particular religious community. And uh, if you are a person that is part of a religious community and you believe the dogmatic teachings are true, then you are uh, called an orthodox member of that community. You're lining up with the, traditional, with the traditional teachings or convictions of the community. If you're someone who uh, is perhaps not as conservative and there are parts of your religious tradition that you agree with, but there are other teachings that you deny, then you would be described as heterodox because you're lining up with some of the teachings, uh, but you're not lining up with all of them. And then if you uh, are have been seen as part of a religious community and then you deny a religious teaching that's considered one of the most paramount teachings, one of the most important teachings, you are then labeled a heretic. And you may have heard that term before, heresy or heretic is when you deny one of the most important convictions of a religious community, and you're then seen as an outsider. If you've ever heard of the Protestant Reformation, that happened when uh, a monk named Martin Luther challenged some of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, and so therefore he was considered a heretic. And of course, we had then many other religious traditions within Christianity unfold from there. Okay, and then uh, lastly, one of the biggest issues within religious studies is over the um, condition uh, of salvation. And I've given you the really fancy academic word for that here. It's the last word on bullet number one. Uh, soteriology, or the teachings within religious traditions about what it means to be a saved person or uh, maybe a liberated person a freed person or maybe an enlightened person have to understand depending upon the particular religious tradition that we are studying uh, what salvation looks like or what enlightenment looks like will be some very different things. Now when we come to an exclusivist religion uh, this is one that claims that it is the religion that holds absolute truth and that any uh, person or any religious group that does not agree with that group's perspective uh, will not be able to participate in the divine or an ultimate reality. In other words, that religious group would be excluding you. Um, unless you believe this about Muhammad, uh, you are an outsider and cannot be uh, freed or liberated from sin. Um, if you come from some particular Christian traditions, unless you believe this particular view of a, of a triune God, the Trinity, uh, then you are someone who is, is, is excluded. You're outside uh, that community. And so every religious tradition, but more so the Western ones than the Eastern ones, will have this exclusivist component. Now, an inclusivist religion will claim that it does hold absolute truth, but that its truth could be uh, the ultimate inclusion of everyone. So uh, this would be a religion that says, yes, we believe our myths and our uh, worship results in the right ethical living, and therefore our dogmatic teachings are the right ones. But uh, just because you don't believe our teachings, we're not going to exclude you. There's still some way that you will be included in the picture of salvation or soteriology. 
And then pluralist uh, religion grants validity to its own religious truth claims and also to the claims of others. Uh, this is very common within Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism uh, to say that there are uh, many paths and then therefore many gods that can lead to a place of enlightenment or salvation. And so when we ask these questions about salvation and soteriology, uh, here are some of the uh, questions that people would be asking. Uh, who is going to heaven? and who is going to hell, okay? Who is an insider, who's an outsider? Um, from Sanatana Dharma or a Buddhist perspective, who will be reincarnated as a king because he behaved morally in life, and who will be reincarnated as a dung beetle because he was an absolute jerk and mistreated others? Um, this is one for uh, Judaism. Who will rest well with ancestors in Abraham's bosom, and who will be all alone in Sheol? Um, Sheol in Judaism is simply the place of the dead. And then finally for Islam, uh, who will be granted 70, 72 virgins for dying for his faith, but who will have to face the wrath of Allah? So all of these questions from different religious traditions let us see uh, this component of insidership and outsidership that are part of the salvation or soteriology question. Okay, please remember that for this week, I am going to go ahead and put up a second lecture uh, probably on Wednesday or Thursday because I want you to have a little more time with this material because you do have an online open book, open note test over this lecture and the one that will follow later in the week. And you'll be able to take that um, on uh, next week, uh, probably have it up by Tuesday. So you'll have about four or five days to find time to take that uh, online uh, test over these two introductory lectures. If you've had any technology problems being able to view or listen to this PowerPoint, please contact someone from uh, computer technology at the college because it will be vital to your success that you're able to view these, listen to these, and take notes. Hope you all have a great semester. Please email me if you have any questions.